Thank you very much for coming tonight to the LSE. Uh, my name is John Gray. I'm a, an emeritus professor at LSE. I used to be professor of the history, uh, professor of European thought at the London School, at, at, at LSE. Tonight I'm here in a different capacity. Uh, I'm here to introduce um, my friend Martin Jakes, and who will talk about his book, uh, When China Rules the World, which is in a new edition, greatly uh, enhanced by further evidence and also with a, a new uh, postscript, and who will uh, what, talk to the book. What we plan tonight is that um, Martin will talk for 40 minutes about the book and his, the main thesis he develops in the book about the way in which the center of gravity of the world both economic and in some respects political, has shifted away from the West, away from Europe, and also away from the United States to China, and what the Chinese experience and the Chinese experiment really means. Uh, after he's talked for uh, 40 minutes, um, he and I will have a brief conversation, uh, which I'll raise one or two questions about what he said, um, but then we'll move on to open the discussion to the floor and give plenty of time for people who wish to ask questions to be able to do so, about half an hour, I hope. Um, now, I've been asked to announce that uh, there is a hashtag for tonight. Um, it's for those who want to tweet, tweet or Twitter uh, uh, during, the, uh, during, during the actual uh, event. It's hash LSE China. Can you see it on, the, on there? So we encourage people to do that. Um, so I will begin simply by o opening um, the floor to, to Martin, who will talk about his book, the ideas in the book, the evidence in the book, and what the meaning of the book is now. Well, thank you very much, John, for, for agreeing to chair this. Um, I have to say that one of the, the great pleasures for me was um, I, I was for some reason in touch with John in 2000, the first half of 2009, and um, about God knows what it was, and he just said, oh, I'm, I'm reading your book at the moment, and you were so um, uh, praising of it, I... It was, it, was, it was great. I think you were about the first person to say anything about it. So. Um, anyway, that's, that's very nice. Um, right, well, uh, 40 minutes. Um, there are two things I want to say uh, by way of introduction. Um, the first is, um, in 1978, the Chinese economy was about one twentieth of the size of the American economy, so when it was growing at 10% a year, to be quite frank with you, it didn't make much difference to anyone outside China. Um, barely a ripple, even for the, in the first decade or so uh, in uh, East Asia. But of course, now it's over half the size of the American economy, closing fast, and actually we're no longer talking really about the transformation of China. We're talking about the transformation of the world. In a remarkably short space of time, China's rise is restructuring uh, the global economy in a way that we've never seen before anything like this. I mean, uh, the nearest parallel would be the rise of America, especially after the Civil War and up to 1914. But it was on nothing like this scale. The growth rate was more like 3.5% 3, 3 and the population, of course, was much smaller. The other point I want to make is this, that um, China, of course, is not, does not have Western origins um, or Western coordinates. Uh, it's very different. And uh, we are habituated uh, since the emergence of the modern era, uh, that I will call the modern era, starting with the British Industrial Revolution, um, to be thinking in... Uh, Western terms. Um, and we've come to assume uh, that uh, all societies will end up in some way like our own. 
that we are the universal model for uh, modernity. Of course, this is not the case. Isn't it, but we've seen this progressively in the second half of the um, 20th century. And Japan, of course, is a classic, actually, classic example of this, but for various reasons we haven't recognized it properly. Um, and China. The rise of China will be absolutely the confirmation of this. China has never been Western, it isn't Western, and it's never going to be Western. It will learn, also as it is, huge amounts from the West, but it will not be Western. It will remain profoundly different. And I think that actually this is our biggest problem of all. I'm not going to talk except to, uh, towards the end about um, you know, the rise of China and how it's changing the world. I'm going to talk about it, but first of all, I want to concentrate on how to think about China. What does China's difference actually mean? And I'm going to offer uh, four uh, propositions to you um, in terms of trying to make sense of China. Now, the first is, of course, um, China. I'm not quite sure where to point this out. Well, that'll do, won't it? <laughs> right. I mean, uh, China call, has called itself a nation state for about a century. But, of course, China's hugely older than that. These were the boundaries of um, China uh, in 221 BC with the victory of the Qin Dynasty at the end of the Warring State uh, period. And if you go on to the Han Dynasty, the rough, these are rough maps, um, already the boundaries of central and eastern China today, Chinese borders here, you know, the Han Dynasty was not far short of it. Um, and this is over uh, 2,000 years ago. And China is the longest continuously existing polity in the world. This region is very different because this, the Western, region, Western regions were not essentially mainly occupied by the Han, and these were conquered much, much later by the Qing dynasty from the mid-17th uh, century uh, onwards. But the heartlands of China, as we know it, you know, are here. And the fascinating thing, I think, that comes from this uh, history is that the Chinese sense of who they are, of what it means to be Chinese, of what China is, is derived essentially, I think, from its uh, history as a civilization, or what I call a civilization state, rather than, as in the Western instance, sometimes exclusively, often overwhelmingly, or largely at least, from the history of being a nation state. So, you know, Confucian values, very distinctive relationship between the state and society, this very distinctive conception of the family, um, social customs like Guanxi, uh, like uh, ancestral worship, social relations like Guanxi, or even Chinese food or Chinese medicine, all of these things come from China, China's history as a civilization state. This is so different from the West. I mean, I think of Western um, countries essentially as constituted on the basis of nation, China is constituted on the basis of civilization. So, China is a civilization state, one, because of its extraordinary longevity, two, because unusually there's a, co a strong coincidence historically between civilization um, and state. This is, for example, very different um, from uh, the Indian uh, example. And the third characteristic of China as a civilization state, of course, is its sheer scale, demographic, and, um, and uh, geographical. I mean, those four provinces between them have a population larger than that of the United States. You add those five provinces, all nine of these have a population as large or larger than that um, of the UK. China, although often we tend to think of it, uh, for whatever reasons, um, as rather homogeneous, it, it isn't. I mean, it's a continent with the disparities of a continent. Um, I mean, uh, the economic, uh, you know, the economic disparities, for example, Gansu, one of the poorer provinces, Shanghai, uh, the richest. But it's not just in terms of economic disparities, it's great, actually great political, cultural and, and social differences um, across China. So for these reasons, I think we, we can't make sense of China primarily as a nation state. Of course, it does have some of the features of a nation state. And, 
it's acquired those over the last century. But primarily, to understand China, we've got to think of it, I think, in different terms as a civilization state. And I want to give you two examples of what it means in practice um, to, to illustrate the point. The first, um, I mean, John and I have been talking about the European crisis just now. And um, uh, the first is the most important political value, not just for the Chinese government or its leaders or its emperors, uh, but, it, but historically for its people, for the Chinese side, is unity. This has been absolutely fundamental to the Chinese ever since the end of the, essentially, at the end of the warring state uh, period. And um, uh, the reason it's been so important, I think, is because uh, uh, the worst periods of Chinese history have been associated with uh, instability, uh, breakdown of order, uh, balkanization, fragmentation, and so on. I mean, a classic illustration is the century of, so-called century of humiliation from the mid-19th uh, to the mid-20th uh, century. I mean, keeping a, a, a country of this size together is hugely, hugely uh, uh, difficult. So for the Chinese, their default mode of thinking is China as a huge state. And contrast that with Europe, which went historically in exactly the opposite direction. I mean, Europe, 2,000 years ago, was united in the Holy Roman Empire. And then over time, it broke up into uh, lots of different territories. And today, we know the default mode of Europe is uh, the nation state. And that reason why it's so difficult to resolve, for example, the Eurozone crisis, etc., is that is that remains the fundamental way in which Europeans view uh, Europe. So here you have a really classic difference. If you want to know why Mao is more, much more popular today in China, despite everything, um, than Deng Xiaoping, who is the architect of its prosperity, the reason is because it was Mao that, from 1949, put the country back together again, reunited uh, China, um, restored, if you like, the unity of, China, of Chinese civilization, uh, expelled the foreign invaders, const reconstituted the state, crucial agency in Chinese, uh, in China, uh, once more as an effective institution. Um, so then that is really, I think, why Mao is so important uh, for the Chinese, because this is the key value. The second point I want to make is more prosaic, the second example, which is, <clears throat> you remember the um, uh, handover of Hong Kong in 1997 from uh, Britain to China. And the Chinese offer was, one country, two systems. Now, I would imagine that hardly anyone uh, in the UK understood what the Chinese were on about. It's a completely unfamiliar concept. And I think probably we thought, well, once China gets its hands on Hong Kong, it'll become like the rest of China. Well, over 15 years later, uh, we know uh, that this wasn't the case. That actually, Hong Kong is as different today, politically and legally, as it was in 1997. So why didn't we understand them? Well, we didn't understand them because our mentality is a nation-state mentality. So if you take the unification of Germany after um, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, what happened? Well, essentially East Germany disappeared and the new unified Germany was constituted on the basis of the old Federal Republic of Germany, uh, West Germany. And that was a perfectly logical solution for the Germans because you know, Germany is a nation-state. What's, what's a nation-state philosophy? One nation, one system. But equally logically for the Chinese, um, it was one country, two systems for Hong Kong. Why? Because actually you can't hold together a country of this scale and this diversity. You can't hold a continent together of this scale and this diversity on the basis of one civilization, one system. I mean, China has always been, in all sorts of ways, much more diverse than that. Of course, historically it was an empire, but we'll come back to that. So... Um, so it's perfectly logical for the Chinese to think like that. Just like Taiwan, I mean, I think within the next 10 to 20 years, probably because it's got nowhere else to go, I think, historically speaking, uh, Taiwan will accept uh, Chinese sovereignty. And what will the Chinese do? The Chinese will, I think, uh, will offer uh, not just one, one country, two systems, but a very liberal interpretation of it where Taiwan will be allowed to keep its electoral system, universal suffrage, multi-party system, and the rest of it. Why? Because for the Chinese, the issue is not the system. It is the principle of sovereignty. In other words, a civilization state in this context actually has a different notion of sovereignty to the nation state principle.
So I, I think this is a this is a very interesting uh, question, and I just want to add another thought about the civilization state. Imagine China uh, being the most the predominant country in the world, which I think it will become. So at the heart of the global system will be something which essentially is a civilization state rather than a nation state, as in the case of the US and before that in the case of the UK. What will the implications of that be? I mean, we don't think in these terms because we're so used to the notion of the old European-inspired nation-state system being absolutely sort of the template for international relations, although we only need to go back to prior to 1950 to see it was nation-state, and for most countries they were colonial territories, so that things have changed during the course of this. Now, I would suggest, actually, that with China as a civilization state, this will start redefining the contours, the complexion, the, the, the perception of... Uh, the international system of what, what political units are and so on. I was very interested when I was in India uh, talking about my book in, uh, <coughs> in July. India is very, very different from China, as you know. But when I was talking about the notion of a civilization state, there was tr tremendous interest and great rapport with the idea. Now, of course, India is not a civilization state in the way that China is because it only acquired uh, political independence uh, in 1947. It's a very old civilization, but it's not a civilization state. But it knows all about civilization and it feels this very, very strongly. And so they had a rapport with this uh, idea. And, you know, in the headlines in newspapers, we've got a lot of coverage, uh, headlines in newspapers, you know, the rise of the civilization state. You, I, I've never seen anything like that in any of the Western countries I've spoken in about the book. Because for us, it's not a sort of um, a language that we easily. Uh, or a term that we understand and the concepts involved in are unfamiliar to us. Okay, second point is about, well, it's about the tributary system, but it's more than that. It's, I'm going to ask the question, what is China likely to be, likely to, how is it likely to behave uh, as a global power? I, I think our assumptions about it are probably something like this. Well, it will be like the United States, but worse, because it's, um, it's, uh, it's not a democracy, because it's uh, a communist country, whatever that means, and because, uh, well, you know, it's ethnically and racially very different and so on. Um, well, I, I, I think this is a, a poor way of thinking about it, and I think it's a poor steer on how to understand what China might be like. And it, I think it's probably much too pessimistic as well. Um, you often get, um, in the, say, the relationship between China and Africa, as you will be familiar, you know, the new colonialism is often talked about in articles and so on. Uh, th this is a very misleading way of thinking, I think. Uh, and it shows you how powerful uh, European stroke Western assumptions about themselves are when it comes to thinking about something like China. In fact, China never had any overseas colonial possessions. I mean, this was a European game which the Japanese later, after the major restoration, uh, imitated. Um, but the Chinese didn't, I mean, the Chinese could have done. I mean, take the Ming Dynasty, the early Ming Dynasty in the early 15th century. I mean, they had the resources, they had uh, the huge ships, you know, much bigger than anything Christopher Columbus had. So, uh, so it would have been a doddle, actually, for the Chinese to colonize Southeast Asia in that period and onwards, but they didn't. And the reason they didn't, I think, was because it was not part of the Chinese mentality. It was not how they saw things. Now, one interesting aspect of the relationship of, of China and the West is they do share a, an important characteristic, both, un, unlike Japan, for example. Both China and the West think of themselves as universal, as a model for others, as a template in some degree or other for others. But the way it works in practice is very, very different. For the West, for, we're talking about Europe and then latterly the United States picking up on many of those traditions, but in the first, it, Europe, Europe saw its universalism as essentially something that it should project around the world uh, ultimately in the form of a colonial empire. In other words, it exported its values and it uh, sought to civilize the rest of the world by the use of force, of course, ultimate, uh, and then, and then um, an, an annexation. Now, 
the Chinese didn't go, didn't, didn't see their universalism in those terms at all. The Chinese didn't look outwards, they looked inwards. Their notion of universalism was the Middle Kingdom, the land under heaven. This was what sort of was perfection. This was the most civilized, this is the, the, the peak of civilization. So why step outside it? Why step outside it into varying degrees of barbarism? barbarism? So the Chinese mentality was completely different. The Chinese mentality was essentially, if you like, stay at home, or at least stay within your own continent, because they did expand across their continent, but they didn't expand uh, overseas. And this is, a, I think, a very important difference. So, you know, the, Ch the emperor's attitude, for example, from the, the two Chinese migrants who went from the southern coastal uh, areas into Southeast Asia, particularly from the 12th century and almost, was they were stepping outside, outside of civilization. They are deserving of no protection. Contrast that with the attitude of European powers to the, you know, the great colonial figures um, with name, uh, street names and statues and so on erected in most cities uh, towards them. Now, the other difference, I think, that reinforces this is that the other difficulty the Chinese have always had is that, which has persuaded them to stay at home, is because running a country of this scale is hugely difficult. So the great preoccupation of Chinese rulers has always been, you know, how do you, how do you maintain order, how do you maintain stability, how do you keep the place together. If you don't keep the place together, the mandate of heaven will be withdrawn, there will be a huge eruption, and you'll be overthrown. So that's historically what happened throughout, uh, throughout Chinese history. And so the Chinese had another reason, which I think is as strong today as it was then. You know, how do you keep the place together? I mean, you know, the, the old story about Hu Jintao or uh, Xi Jinping, you know, sitting down uh, uh, with their to-do list for the day, and, you know, the first of the 20 items on the agenda, the first 19 will be something to do with China's internal governance, etc., rather than uh, foreign uh, relations. So I think we should see China's behavior as a global power in very different terms to the way in which uh, it's happened uh, uh, to, the, to the European stroke uh, American uh, experience. I think actually uh, it's very unlikely that, in, that China would behave in a military fashion in, in, with such an emphasis on hard power like the United States or indeed like Europe in which it was very bellicose and aggressive and expansive. Uh, I think the, the two classical forms, I suspect, of Chinese, of Chinese global power will be one, economic. You know, I think that China, assuming its rise continues, a big question mark, of course, but let's assume it, uh, that its rise con uh, continues, the kind of economic, relative economic power it will enjoy will be hugely greater than anything the United States has ever had. I mean, you know, if the, if the Chinese, for example, have the same standard of living as the Americans, the Chinese economy would be four times the size of the American economy. And the other thing that I think is extremely important to the Chinese, which I'll come back to, and a week, uh, is a, will be a, a sort of key form of the expression of their power, will be cultural. This, the Chinese sense of cultural hubris and cultural identity is extremely important, and I think we'll see that uh, uh, played out over time. My third point is, uh, which I'll try and keep more briefly, is about race and ethnicity, which actually follows on from what I've just said. And this is not normally talked about, you know, uh, uh, international relations scholars um, scandalously neglect this question. Uh, they always talk about, by and large, or tend to uh, major on relations between nation states and the, and the paraphernalia of foreign ministries and diplomats and all that kind of thing. But actually, this is, I think, in broad terms, much more influential. Now, we all know that China has a huge population, 1.3 billion people. Um, but not everyone is aware that uh, over 90% of the Chinese think of themselves as of the same race. And this is an extraordinary phenomenon because it's so different from the next four most populous countries in the world, India, the United States, uh, Indonesia and Brazil, all of which think of themselves as being, of course, multiracial in varying degrees and multicultural. The Chinese don't think like that. Now you can say, okay, well, obviously historically it was. Well, yeah, but the point is, why do the Chinese think like this? Why do over nine out of ten Chinese think of themselves uh, as Han? Now this takes us back 
I think, to the civilization state. You cannot understand this phenomenon, this phenomenon without uh, going back to the fact that China is very, very old. I mean, here we ought to really go back much further than 2,000 years. But a very, very long process of all sorts of things. Uh, don't let's be romantic about this. You know, war, civil war, uh, absorption, assimilation, uh, extermination, government resettlement, nothing new about that. Um, created a, a long, long process taking place in this part of China, which is what we're talking about, which slowly eroded the sense of difference between uh, the different races uh, of this part uh, of China. But this was, of course, what, what, what gave this um, force and a special sense of identity was the emergence over a long historical period of a very, very powerful sense of Chinese cultural identity. You know, China, uh, 12,000 years ago, roughly at the same time as the Fertile Crescent, home to the first settled agriculture in the world, home to the beginnings of relatively complex societies based on emergent forms of division of labor, early forms of centralized power, uh, state institutions in a very primitive sense. It's no accident two and a half thousand years ago, you know, Confucius uh, was an extremely advanced thinker uh, in the, for his time on principles of governments, responsibilities of leaders, um, how, to, how to conceive of, of the state's relationship with society, uh, and so on. Or moving into the period I'm talking about now, of course, China's had, you know, not one period in the sun, but many, especially the Tang Dynasty, and the, most remarkably the Song Dynasty, but also the early part of the Ming and parts of the Qing Dynasty. So this has given the Chinese a very, very powerful sense of their own cultural worth and importance. Um, this is, in a way, the calling card, I think, uh, of the Chinese. It gives them a, a real sense of hubris and, I think, a very strong sense of superiority. Anyone knows about China, China the Chinese uh, uh, know this sort of deep inner confidence about where, you know, one day they will be... Up, one day they will rise again. It's just historical uh, inev inevitability. The great advantage of this process, I don't think it's conceivable that what is essentially an empire, you know, where all of the empires have disappeared, that this extraordinary territory, vast territory with so many people could have held together without uh, this cement of the Han identity. The weakness of it, the weakness, certainly looking at it from outside, I think, is that the Han have a weak conception of cultural difference, a weak respect for cultural difference, and you can see that played out very clearly in the way the Uyghur in Xinjiang and the Tibetans have been handled, and I think this is the greatest single failure, actually, of government policy uh, in China since 1949. Now, the fourth point I want to make is this. It's about the state. Now, we generally regard the Chinese state to be the Achilles heel of China. You know, this is, ah, nailed it. This is the problem. This is why the thing isn't going to, you know, this is why the thing's not going to be sustained. Now, I want to contest this uh, uh, view. Um, we think in the West that essentially the legitimacy of a state is a function uh, of democracy. In fact, we've come to the belief, for some reason, that this is almost exclusively a function of democracy. Now, if you think about Italy, you can see that that is clearly not the case, because the Italians have had more elections than I've ever had hot dinners, and yet the, the great problem of Italian governments is a chronic lack of legitimacy of the state in the eyes of the Italians. Now, look at China. China, clearly, uh, I would argue that the Chinese state enjoys more legitimacy authority in the eyes of the Chinese than any Western state. And it clearly is that the reason can't possibly be Western-style democracy because it doesn't have anything like that. Um, so what's the reason? Well, I would argue the reason for this is back to the civilization state. The Chinese conception of the state is totally different from a Western tradition. There, they see the state as the embodiment, the expression, um, the personification, actually, of... Chinese civilization. That is the great responsibility, to maintain the integrity and the unity of Chinese civilization, of the Chinese, of, of, of the civilization state. That's how uh, the Chinese view um, uh, the state. Nothing, actually, nothing could, in those terms, nothing could be more uh, important. 
So the Chinese have a very different attitude towards Westerners uh, when it comes to state. And we, depending on where you are on the political spectrum, think, you know, we, well, if you're in the Tea Party, you probably view it as a, a sort of the enemy in our in, incarnate. But basically, we all share a view that the, that, that the powers of the state need to be codified, they need to be limited, uh, they need to be, uh, and there's lots of things that the state shouldn't get involved in. The Chinese, on the other hand, I mean, there are no clear boundaries. There never have been any clear boundaries to the power of the state in China. But their view of the state is different. They don't view the state as a stranger, as a, something uh, untoward, uh, as um, alien. They view it as an intimate. Not just any old intimate, but like a member of the family, as a member of the family. I mean, you, in fact, in Chinese, you know, family, state, these terms are often interchangeable. These are the two great, most important institutions of Chinese um, society. And if you, doubt, if you doubt my word on this, you know, there's the interesting uh, survey, Global Attitudes survey by, um, by uh, uh, Pew... Uh, sorry, you've missed all this. Um, uh, uh, but th this is Tony Sage at uh, uh, Kennedy School. And these are levels of satisfaction and four polls he conducted in, in attitudes towards the Chinese state. The, the blue line on the left is the central government, and these are the townships and so on. And you see incredible, incredible high ratings for satisfaction with government. So I would argue, actually, that far from being the Achilles heel of China, the state is actually, you know, the Chinese state is a remarkable institution, which is in many ways extremely competent. Horses for course is much more competent than Western states, even though it's a poor, still essentially a poor uh, developing society. And it offers a great challenge to us. We always talk about, uh, when we come, come to the state, we always talk about elections, and how, you, how, how the state is constituted by elections, etc. We don't talk about the competent state. The Chinese talk about it, everything in a completely the reverse order. They talk about um, uh, uh, the competence of the state. This is an old, if you like, Confucian-style tradition. So I would suggest to you that actually the rise of China and the decline of the West will see a major debate in the West about what the Chinese state is all about and what it might offer us. I mean, we can't be like that. It's impossible. The history is so different. But what we might learn from the Chinese state. And the pa Chinese paradigm in this context on the state is, is very unusual. It's completely unfamiliar to us. The Chinese historically, one, you, an ubiquitous state and still is a ubiquitous state. And two, a commitment to a really ferocious market. And apart from the Mao period, I think that tells its own story. You know, that has been true for a long time uh, in, uh, in China. So those are my four points. Now, I just want to say some quick words um, about where we are now. Um, uh, that was uh, ground zero for the Western economies at the beginning of 2008 before the financial crisis. And most, Chinese, uh, most Western economies are still smaller, Britain included, of course, than they were then. And that's been Chinese growth uh, over that period. Um, and the most obvious expression of this is that when Goldman Sachs produced its well-known um, projections for um, the which are the largest economies in uh, 2007, they projected the Chinese economy overtaking the American economy in 2027. And now um, the figure is, uh, is somewhere around 2018, you know, just about five years uh, down the road. And I want to suggest that actually 2008 was really quite a key historical moment uh, with regard to the rise of China and the relationship between China and the United States. I mean, it marked a powerful shift in power from the States uh, to China. It also, by the way, I mean, and, 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 and this is ongoing. I mean, it's ongoing because we haven't solved the crisis in the West. In fact, the, the crisis, something we were talking about before, the crisis is very deep. We don't understand the reasons for it. And I think probably 10 years is an optimistic scenario. Um, so this is a crisis not only which is an economic crisis, but it's also a crisis of the political elites, um, 
and as John argued today in uh, his piece in The Guardian, it's a crisis of le the legitimacy, actually, of these elites, certainly in Europe, not so clearly in the United States, at least uh, uh, not uh, yet. Well, I remember in 2009, you know, I, I used to, when the book first came out, I used to put all these projections and so on, and there was always, I could see there was a certain, you know, Christ, really? No, it can't be true. It's not going to be like that reaction. Um, and then someone would always get up in there invariably and say, well, you know, it's, the, the future is never an extrapolation of the past. True. And there will be a crisis in China, and it, what's happening is unsustainable. Well, there was a crisis. There was a huge crisis. But it didn't happen in China. It happened in the West. Now, I think we're moving into a new era now. Um, since 2008, which I would describe as the very beginnings, just the beginnings of a Chinese economic world order. Not a political world order, an economic world order. By which I mean that China is now becoming more important as a shaper of the global economy and globalization than uh, the United States. And I think it's got three key, this process has got three key characteristics. Um, First of all, trade. I mean, tr China is a huge trader, soon to be the largest importer of the world, in the world, for reasons we know about. Huge, they're very poor in most natural resources, so iron ore, you know, they, they take a huge proportion of uh, these kind of raw materials. And the other reason is because China is an extremely competitive manufacturing uh, country, and um, this chart here which, of course, you can't read up there, so I'll, you'll have to take my word for it. Um, but uh, there's been an absolutely remarkable transformation over the last 20 years in China's position. This is, these are, this is, this is Latin America, North America, Europe is here, uh, S South Asia, a couple of African countries, North Africa and East Asia, Australia at the bottom. And in 1992, exactly 20 years ago, if you look at the proportion of trade of these countries... All these countries with China, it was minute. I bet you in 1990, uh, 1992, probably there wasn't a single country would count China as the main trading partner. Then, you know, but most of these are 0 point something other, 1 point something other. Then you go to 2001, nine years later, and it's, it, it's beginning to take off, but still 2, 3, 4% apart from East Asia, which is travelling, of course, much quicker because it's China's backyard. Now, if you come to 2010, there's an extraordinary transformation. Do you know that? All those color, countries coloured green now count China as their main trading partner. It's no longer, as it was, concentrated simply in East Asia. That's been established now for about 10 to 15 years. But, you know, the following countries, for example, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Venezuela, United States, Russia, Pakistan, India, South Africa, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Malaysia, probably Indonesia, I don't think the Philippines, and Australia, all count China as the main, their main trading partner. Secondly, China's become a major financial power. In 2009 and 2010, the China Development Bank and the China Export-Import Bank, between them, lent more to the developing world than uh, the World Bank, one of the two great institutions of the post-war American world order. And the third thing is, which is galloping towards us is the rise of the renminbi, decision taken at the end of 2008 to enable the renminbi to be used in the settlement of trade. Now, 10% has only started in 2010. 10% of Chinese trade is, with, is conducted in the renminbi, and the HSBC has projected that between 2013 and 2015, half of China's trade with the developing world will, be, will take place in the renminbi. The rise of, if it's in the renminbi, it won't be conducted uh, in the dollar. So what we're seeing in this period is, you know, some huge, you know, gravitational shifts uh, taking place. Um, I mean, I smiled in a way, ironically, when I heard on the, uh, on the radio the other day that the British could no longer afford to keep their um, consulate in Benghazi. Uh, and there were dark warnings that actually what would happen was that it would open the door for business in uh, that part of Iraq for the Chinese and the Koreans. I mean, watch that. What's that sucking sound? It's the sound of the West sort of rolling back on its commitments because it can't afford it. And what's that gushing sound? It's the sound of China as it 
uh, you know, with the, the kind of growth rate it's got and so on, expanding, expanding, expanding into uh, new sorts of areas. Well, I'm going to finish with this thought for you. And that is, um, uh, can we really come to terms with this new world? Is the West going to be able to, to respond to it? Um, there's a very interesting um, passage in a book by Stephen Cohen, the American sinologist, so a historian of China. And he says something like this. He says, we think of the West as the most cosmopolitan of cultures, but in many ways it's the most provincial. And what he means by that is that essentially the West for 200 years has been dominant in the world and therefore has been essentially able to order its relations with all others on its terms because of its economic power and if necessary of course frequently by force classically in the period of colonialism whereas the rest of the world which is you know, pushing 85% of the world has been in the opposite situation I mean, every country in the world had to contend over the last two centuries with the sheer might of Western power. Everyone had to reckon with it, and they had all sorts of different ways of handling it, from the Meiji restoration in the face of potential colonization by the Japanese to colonization for most of the, uh, uh, for, for most countries. Um, but the result of that is that these countries, these peoples, were required, these cultures had to understand, often in a rather brutal way, what the West was all about. And that, I think, is uh, what Co when Cohen's arguing about the um, cosmopolitanism of other cultures. I think this is true. Now, the question is, with the rise of China, we're now forced into a completely different situation we've never, ever had to address before. We've always, in the past, been able to address the other from a position of might and inequality. We won't be able to do that now. We have to learn to live in a world which is increasingly, in Western terms, unfamiliar to us. The institutions, the values, the practices, the sources of power, and so on. Can we respond uh, to that challenge? Uh, do we know how to do it? And I think we, this is a sort of big kind of philosophical question for us. I don't think we should take it for granted that we'll be successful. It requires a huge shift in our mentality. I mean, how do we try and make sense of China now? We're always trying to make sense of it through a Western prism, through a Western mindset, through Western ideas, Western history, Western experience. You know? So what we think about China is not, by and large, actually what the Chinese think about China. So this, I think, is the great challenge. And it's not inevitably successful. I mean, if you sort of think about what happened to China, it, after 1800, I mean, China in 1800 was at the same level of development uh, at least as northwestern Europe, Britain, etc. And what happened to China? It, it, it couldn't. It didn't industrialize. It, 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 it couldn't reform, and it went into profound decline. For two centuries, actually, the Chinese economy was stagnant. Um, now, I'm not saying the same fate awaits us, but we should not assume that we can adjust to this new world. We have to, but if we don't, our situation will be uh, increasingly difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for that very um, lucid and powerful and challenging exposition of the increasingly formative place of China in the world. Now, I think what, as I mentioned, we'd do is I'd put one or two questions to Martin, I think only for about 10 minutes. So we have 30 minutes then, we need to end at 8 o'clock, uh, in which uh, all of you, or some of you, can um, raise questions of your own. But I guess one question which occurred to me, which might have occurred to a number of you listening to Martin, was... Given all you've said and accepting all you've said about the transformative position of China in the world now, might 
some would might say, uh, I accept all that, uh, Martin. I accept, for example, the way in which the difference, the different world we already live in, is being adamantly denied, in a sense, in America and elsewhere, mm. where basically say, if there's anything like decline, which is often denied, it's a result only of our mistakes and choices. Yeah. So we can make different choices and avoid decline. In other words, the interpretation of decline is, so to speak, uh, entirely parochial. It's entirely what we did. If we hadn't done this, if we hadn't done that, if we change our policies, we can reverse any decline that may have, have occurred. I think that in itself, I would say, and I agree with you, say this to yourself in your book, is a symptom of decline. The refusal to engage with the reality that other things are happening in the world which have nothing to do or not much to do with your decline or your situation. On the other hand, and here I sort of voice my question, um, rather than this situation, in a sense, moving towards a position in which China assumes the position that America had, or even assumes it in a greater way, a more hegemonic way, as you suggested economically, I can easily envisage a situation we might already be partly in it, in which American hegemony or American centrality is replaced not by Chinese centrality or Chinese hegemony, economic or cultural, but by a world without a hegemon. In other words, by a world in which that no one rules, not that China rules when American rule, where America wants rule, but a world sometimes called in economic context a G0 world, a world without a dominant power. Uh, um, and we can even think of some approximations to it in, in history. Um, I guess the latter part of the 19th century, although it's often identified with British hegemony, the period from about maybe 1870 to 1914, though it's often identified with British hegemony because of British naval power, if we look at back at it now, it was really a, one, a world in which there were a number of great powers, Japan was emerging, it industrialized after all, it's not in the 20th century, but in the Meiji period. By the time of the Battle of Tsushima, it had a, a more than Western-style navy. Mm. Um, Germany was advancing rapidly. Even Tsarist Russia, we think of as being a kind of completely agrarian backwater, had quite rapid industrial development in, in, in some contexts. And America was co coming on the scene. In fact, by the end of the 19th century, what you had was a world of two, three, four, five different powers mm. with relations of competition and conflict in some contexts and then you have the first war of course but um, what we now may be emerging is a world similar except of course with very different players not only China having emerged from the century of humiliation but India having emerged as a powerful uh, force um, uh, um, uh, Brazil uh, and Africa, I think, mm. is emerging also in certain contexts. So might it not be the case that we're moving into a world which, although we experienced it, or our previous generations experienced it 100 years ago, um, uh, a world really without, uh, 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 despite the enormous colonial power that existed then in Europe, which gave Europeans and then subsequently Americans this sense of addressing the world from a position of superiority, really underneath, under the surface, that was a world without a single hegemon. Aren't we now moving into something rather similar, which is even more, in a sense, unfamiliar than what you're talking about? Because at least what you're talking about could be seen as a shift of hegemony. But might there not be an alternative pathway uh, uh, ahead of us in which maybe for a long time there's no um, hegemon? And that could happen for a variety of reasons. One is... Um, the crisis which has occurred in, in Europe and in North America could, and some people think might already have done, extend to China. So the fact that China has escaped the crisis so far might not be permanent. Mm. There might be misallocations of capital. There might be all kinds of um, uh, um, economic chaos under the surface. That might be one reason. The second reason might be America although it can't regain what it has lost, could revive in certain respects because of changing position of energy consumption, mm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. But for whatever reasons, 
some of which we can't guess. We could, we, could, we could imagine a situation, realistically, entirely realistically, in which maybe for generations from now, there will be no globally dominant power. Do you think that's possible? I do, yeah. I mean, first of all, just on, very briefly on your first point about decline. Um, of course, the fundamental reason uh, the world is changing is not because of what's happening in, or what's been happening in terms of policy choices and so on to America or Europe, yeah. actually. The, the fundamental reason is the transformation of China mm. and, of course, the other developing countries as well. That is the real reason. So the question one should, uh, should ask probably is not, you know, wow, look what's happened uh, with the rise of China since 1978, um, but we should look at it with a, not, a different eye probably and say, you know, Look, if you look at history, it was obvious that at some point when China got its act together, it was going to change the world mm. because the last 200 years have been very exceptional. Abnormal, actually. Yeah. Abnormal. Absolutely. The, the, yeah. the last 200 years is very weird because it's been, the world has been dominated by a, such a tiny minority of humanity. Um, that was not true previously, partly because, of course, power was different then, mm. but also because, you know, it, crudely speaking, it reflected demography previously. So the Chinese economy was the biggest followed by India. On the, on the big question you raise, uh, I mean, I don't think there'll be any simplistic transfer of power from America to China. Uh, I, I don't see it like that. Um, I think it's much more complicated than that. Um, uh, because, uh, well, China's not in a position, actually, in any case, uh, I mean, it's still a developing economy. Half the population still lives in the countryside. Uh, it's only halfway through its economic takeoff. Uh, if you look at China as a superpower, well, really, it, you know, it doesn't have that capacity. I mean, well, look at its military power. It's only just acquired, in the process of acquiring its first aircraft carrier, um, which is based on a, a hull it purchased from the Ukraine which isn't too intimidating, is it, really? <laughs> and, um, and likewise, you know, its political influence is very limited. Why? Look at Chinese foreign policy. Chinese foreign policy is absolutely moulded to the principles of Deng Xiaoping, economic growth, and uh, priorities of Deng Xiaoping, economic mm. growth and reduction of poverty. Mm. So China's not, you know, it doesn't think in those kind of hegemonic <laughs> terms. Mm. So much better would be to think, well, you know, America became the largest economy in the world when? I think in the 1890s, if I remember correctly. But it wasn't until after 1945 that uh, the United States became the, the, the hegemon that we now mm. think of as being a permanent sort of situation. Mm. And there's one other thought I'd like to uh, mention in this context as well, and that is the, trend, the rise of China is much more complicated than the rise of the United States after Britain. Why? Because already the world had been heavily westernised because of Britain, Britain's role, the British Empire, and so on. And, of course, the other countries were all part of a sort of, you know, European tradition. We are totally unfamiliar with China. Um, so, you know, people say, well, what, what's Chinese soft power? Well, you know, we can only, I mean, in the long run, Chinese culture will only exercise the kind of um, possible influence I suggested in my, in my uh, talk. Uh, when people are much more intimate and familiar with these things. So I, I think these are long processes. So I, don't, I think the world will be, I agree with you, uh, will be uh, much more complicated for some time to come. I mean, in a way, John, you could say, well, you know, the American era has been quite unusual, historically speaking, to have a country so dominant. But even that, you have to divide between, between, into two periods because of the Cold War. And also, I mean, the British period was extraordinarily short. Yeah. I mean, the British period of imperial domination was second half of the 19th century. Um, we'll move on now, but I remember reading just past, uh, um, Maynard Keynes wrote a letter, I think in 1916, about war financing to the British government saying, look, I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm not saying we should do anything else. I'm not saying we can do anything else. But you do realize that if we finance the war in the way we're financing, this was the First World War, not the Second World War, um, economic and financial hegemony will pass to the United States. Yeah. 
So the period of hegemony, I mean, astute observers could see the period of hegemony for Britain was about 50 years, mm. if that. Mm. And the American period has been similar. Of course, someone might say, well, might not the Chinese period be equally short? But uh, let's, um, uh, let's open the uh, discussion now. What I'd like you to do, if this is okay, there are mics, there are roving mics. If you would like to, it's not a precondition, you don't have to do this, but if you'd like to say who you are when you um, ask a question, and given that we want to get as many people as possible to be able to ask their questions and have them answered by Martin, not by me, I'll simply field the questions to Martin. Um, if you could ask a question rather than making a long comment, uh, uh, if you have a question, put it to him. And I wonder, shall I take questions in twos and threes? Yeah, that's a good one. We'll take them in twos and threes, and I'll take a note as we go along. Now, I see a gentleman at the back. I think you were the first to put your hand up. So I'll take you first, if that's okay. Can I suggest that um, we are returning to the kind of world that we were in about 2,000 years ago and also about 500 years ago, where you have a number of major civilizations of roughly the same weight and uh, development. But, of course... 2,000 years ago and uh, 500 years ago, there was relatively little connection between those different civilizations which developed. Is that your question? And the, the point is, <laughs> the, now they are interconnected. Yes. You know, they are integrated. So how do these four okay. or five major okay. powers resolve the kind of common problems that result from an integrated world? So that's the, the first question. It's like some hundred years ago, 500 years ago, but different because they're all much more interconnected now. How do they resolve their differences? I'll take, um, I think, one up there. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, let me see who's the first hand. The hand that was up there was, was, I think, you were the first. Yeah. Um, my question is do you think Mandarin will become the next uh, world language? Yes. Uh, will Mandarin become? Can you say it again, Lada? I heard, will, will Mandarin become the first world language? And what was this? Next after English. That's the second question. We take one more. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, someone there. Yeah, please go ahead. There'll be plenty more time if everyone's brief. I come from China, and um, I have to say that you know more about China than I do. <laughs> um, you kept mentioning that Chinese culture difference with, with Western styles, which I agree. But my qu first question is, does Chinese culture mainly contribute to Chinese growth? Or is it due to other reasons? Uh, like India, it also grows very fast, uh, as well as China. Uh, so I think maybe the main reason is due to its huge population, which gives this large amount of cheap labor but its population dividends is now diminishing due to um, Deng Xiaoping's one-child policy, contrast to Mao Zedong's pro-breeding. Um, so actually, it's, it's hugely going to an uh, Asian population now, China. So it's more about a pessimistic picture, more than about an optimistic one. That's my first question. A second question is also about Chinese culture. Uh, actually, frankly speaking, now, Chinese teenagers nowadays are all being impacted by Western culture rather than about their ancient culture themselves. Fewer Chinese students can recite Confucian's work or ancient work. We all, well, actually I'm arguing of we're all universally still in Western style. We all know mathematics, we all know um, Western, um, Western scientific knowledge rather than about ancient knowledge about China. Do you want to formulate that as, as a single yes, question? Yes, two. Thank you. Those two, okay. Yes. I think we'll take those three first and then go on. All right. Do you remember what they were? Yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do you want me to tell you? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, on the first one, it's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, the, the question was, you know, are we returning to a world of you know, 2,000 years ago or whatever, where you had... Um, large countries or civilizations or empires or whatever they were um, which existed in relatively speaking little contact with each other um, and are we moving into a situation like that I mean I think that in a, it's, a, it's an idea worth playing 
Um, uh, my Certainly, of course, you're absolutely right, we now live in a world of hugely greater interconnectedness. Um, and uh, uh, so there are, you know, questions of governance and handling these kind of issues um, are uh, much more acute than they were uh, then. I would, I would just mention two things in, in, in response to your point. The first is that, um, you know, re th th there isn't a relationship of equality or parity between China and India. I mean, I was very forcibly struck by this when I was in India, because um, being very, very used to China, but only occasionally going to India, India is a long, long way behind China. The Chinese economy is four times the size of India and China's still pulling away from India because its growth rate is consistently, except for one or two years, uh, is higher than India. And likewise, if you look at the BRIC countries, you know, China is hugely more important than any of the other countries. So, so even within the developing world space, China is already, I think, hegemonic, and it's likely to, be, uh, to continue to be. That doesn't mean these other countries aren't going to be important players. I think they are. I think India certainly could be an important player. But it will, for as far as I can see, be rather less important than China. Yeah. Um, the other point I was going to make is, is an interesting one about um, governance, actually, um, which is, you know, I think the, 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 the emergence of... I mean, the fascinating thing is we're moving into a world where, you know, China... India, America are going to be big players. You know, I think America is going to continue to be a big player. And uh, you know, China is a fascinating, and India, uh, are fascinating uh, uh, um, expressions of a new kind of governance. I mean, these are huge countries, you know, between 38% of the world's population. So it's not like the, Euro the, the Europeans you know, have thought, well, you know, we, our way of doing things you know, post-war, post-EU is the way to do things, etc. But actually, I think much more important is going to be these megastates, and they're going to order the world much more. And so, within themselves, because they account for so many people, as well as whatever forms of collaboration uh, develop. On the question of Mandarin, um, yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, you've got to remember now... Um, that in terms of uh, representativity, uh, twice as many people in the world speak Mandarin as a first or second language than speak English. Of course, the vast majority of them live in China. <laughs> but still, once you get China rising as a, a hugely important country, then it, you know, its place in the world will no longer be what we're used to, which is being relatively cut <coughs> off, but will be very much part of a global polity. So I think, you know, I, I would be very, very surprised if Chinese doesn't become a really important language. I don't know whether one day it could replace English. I mean, it depends a lot on what happens to the United States. I think a, a language probably requires a patron country. That the rise of English was, uh, was a function of empire, British Empire and then America, especially America. Um, what would happen if that wasn't the case? I mean... French used to be a very important language. It's not much less important now because of the decline of France. So, I mean, languages have... There's a very good book, actually, I recommend, um, called Empires of the Word. Not world, word. Uh, and it's about languages and how they rise and fall and what the factors are behind them. Um, and I can't remember immediately what the author is, but I'll, when I remember it, I'll tell you. Um, but anyway, this is a very interesting subject. F fascinating book, actually. Um, your question... I'm very touched by your introductory remark. <laughs> I paid you for that, didn't I? <laughs> um, well, I think, obviously, Chinese culture in some way or other contributes to Chinese growth, or has done. It's you know, because c countries uh, uh, experience their transformation in specific circumstances according to specific conditions. It's a completely different question to say... The re, that these then become universal conditions, preconditions, 
for any country's growth, as we generalise the European experience in this, this kind of thing, you know, the Protestant ethic or whatever it was. I don't, I don't buy that. But I think that uh, the reason why countries uh, rise at certain times and so on is a mix of conjunctural and structural factors. Uh, and I think that this is definitely the case in China. Um, and, uh, and some of those characteristics are shared across East Asia because China didn't come first. You know, Japan followed by the other Asian tigers before really China uh, took off. So, um, but I don't think anyone who knows anything about China would be surprised by the dynamics of China. I mean, it's not a new thing, is it? I mean, China's got a long, long history, as I tried to say in the opening, of from, in certain periods doing extraordinarily well uh, by global uh, standards. And, you know, and I, I think the Chinese state has got something to do with that. But, you know, in other conditions, the Chinese state can be a constraint on it. You know, it, it depends on the specific, the specific situation. Um, I didn't quite catch what you were after, but I'm going to guess what you were after in your second point. Uh, yeah, of course you're right. Uh, the exposure of Chinese youth in particular to Western ideas, which well, are new forms of modernity really, you know, that, that, uh, uh, that are, are, are new. It's not just, they, ha they come in a Western form, but they're not, because we associate it with the West, but they're actually forms of modernity with not inevitable sense of belonging, if you know what I mean. I mean, could, they, could be, they could be Japanese, I mean, the, or Korean. Korean popular culture has been very influential uh, in China. So, so it doesn't necessarily come uh, in a Western form. And I know, you know, this has created a sense of loss amongst Chinese. They think, well, you know, what's happened to our traditional culture? Uh, we've lost it, you know. I don't, I, I understand this sense of loss, but I don't think it is lost. I don't think it's lost. I think what, what's happening is a huge reworking of Chinese culture that's going on. Huge reworking. Because, you know, of course it's being reworked. Because when you get those kind of huge socioeconomic changes, then you know, some, some parts of the culture will disappear, that's for sure. But other parts will be reworked. So the Chinese family is not suddenly going to become like a Western family. Bet you. <laughs> the Chinese family will remain very distinctive but in new circumstances. So there'll be all, you know, I mean, so the Chinese family in this situation is, is changing very dynamically, but it's still reproducing its characteristics. And this is very interesting about cultures, I think, is the, is the extent to which cultures do reproduce themselves. They don't stay the same, they change like crazy, but there's a sort of DNA, if you like, you can still, this, it's still, you know, it's still recognisably Chinese or it's still recognisably British or it's still whatever. We just comment on that. We've, we've assumed that when cultures interact, they become more similar. Maybe when they interact, they become more different. Even. True, they can be, yeah. But different from what they've been yeah. in the past. Yeah, exactly. I've got three more. The gentleman has been waiting a long time here. Uh, thank you. My name's John Ewan. My question's on the foreign policy dimension. Thank you. Because as uh, China becomes stronger, Obviously, we're going to have to pay more attention to it. To be specific, have the Chinese got the ability or the willingness to defuse the situation in the Korean Peninsula? Because the Americans don't seem to have been very successful. Thank you. A gentleman up there was waiting a long, long time. Could he get a microphone? Uh, thank you. My name is Ramesh Shukla. Um, I'm an Asian, and I welcome Chinese rice. And uh, it's a fascinating story, no doubt. But I have some doubts. And doubts are these. By all accounts, and you also insisted on it, that Chinese is a very conformist culture, a very conformist culture. It is very over-differential to the authority. Now, such culture, one would expect, would be deficient on creativity in finding new solutions, new ideas, and uh, if you are looking for leadership, trying to lead the world, then it will have to come up with new ideas, new technology, um, and a high degree of creativity. But as I said, the, I feel that uh, conformist culture of China would stand in the way of that creativity. Um, can you yeah. comment on it? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm conscious that we haven't had a Chinese woman speaker so far. So you've been waiting a long time. 
All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks for your lecture. And we know 100 years ago, um, the literature of Du Xun cannot be win the Nobel Prize because of the translation. And recently, we got uh, Mo Yan, the man who named himself as Shut Up, and uh, he won the Nobel Prize without any political circumstances. And now, um, do you think you, you will start to keen on this kind of new idea um, that the Chinese new scholars will bring out to be published and go around the world and you will start to um, research on this kind of field? Um, Martin, do you want to reply to those now? Yeah, okay. Uh, on the question of uh, foreign policy, um, I, I think that essentially, as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> Chinese foreign policy is still pretty rudimentary. I mean, it's not a comprehensive view because it's been tailored essentially to the problems that China's had, um, which is uh, which are domestic. So it's never seen itself like the United States sees itself. Um, I think that will change over time. Um, and there's a huge debate taking place now in Beijing about what sort of foreign policy China should have. But I don't think we should expect you know, great changes overnight. On the question of the Korean Peninsula, I mean, there is a... I mean, I, I just want to make one general point about this. And that is, it seems to me that Northeast Asia, by which I mean um, Japan, uh, Korea, and Taiwan, uh, is probably the last great bastion of the Cold War. Very, very little has changed. Korea is still divided. North Korea is still isolated. Um, uh, the Japan-China relationship is frozen. Taiwan is still a function of what happened at the end of the Civil War after, uh, after 1949. Um, and if you go to, I mean, I go, you know, to, to these countries on a reasonably regular basis, and you know, I'm really struck in Korea, for example, South Korea by just how much the debate is still bif bifurcated in, in relatively Cold War uh, terms. And the Chinese attitude towards North Korea should be seen in this context as well. You know, I mean, China, China doesn't really have allies. Think of, think of it like it, it doesn't really have... A, I mean, America has lots of military alliances. They're usually military alliances. China has lots of economic relations, but they're not allies. Um, and one of its few allies is... <laughs> But maybe his only ally is North Korea. But obviously that is... It, it, that, I mean, uh, the, 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 the Chinese are dividing the policymakers over how to handle North Korea. Uh, but the re the, they feel a, a sort of sense of loyalty to North Korea because of the long historical period, you know, going back uh, to, um, to the Korean War uh, and so on. But they are pushing and have been pushing hard for them to pursue a new course. You know, they've been pushing... Because actually, the problem is that um, strategically, the relationship with South Korea is much more important, I think, for China than the relationship with North Korea. Um, and uh, South Korea is a swing state in this, in this region. In other words, it, you know, it, historically, it was, a class, it was probably the classic tributary state of China, and it could be very close to China. I mean, you know, I mean, you'll see what happens in the presidential election. If it goes to the left... It'll be a much closer relationship with China and a new rapprochement with North Korea. If it stays where it is, then it'll be what we've had the last, the last, uh, is it eight years? Eight years. Um, so there, there. I don't know whether that helps you. Um, I, I resist. Hi. I, I, I resist the idea that Asians, East Asians of whatever, East Asians, are not capable are only imitative and are not capable of, you know, invention and creation and creativity. I think the reason why uh, we think in these terms of these countries is that their economic transformation is comparatively recent, with the exception of Japan, perhaps. And so, therefore, when, you're, when you are poor, you don't have any choice, essentially, other than to imitate. And to, yeah? And like Taiwan and South Korea were classic examples of it. And, uh, but 
you know, they're pushing the frontiers. I mean, and Japan broke with this. Sure, it, it's, it, in some areas it's not done well, but anyone who lives in Japan knows, or being in Japan knows, that actually in many ways it's very inventive. I mean, I, I, you know, the latest technological gadgets, the toilets, true, John? <laughs> um, you know, the scooters that lights used to turn on automatically. Anyway, the, there's lots of things the Japanese are brilliant at, I think. Uh, but it's a different sort of uh, mindset to the Western way of doing things. Look, China, let's face it, China was historically a hugely creative civilization. I mean, the Song Dynasty provided many of the, the rudiments of the inventions which power, subsequently powered European industrialization. So I see no reason at all why they won't, in time, uh, be successful. But they need to spend money on research and development. They need to have really good universities. These things cost, you know, you know, these things cost money. You know, until recently, the Chinese big firms spent very, very little on R&D. It's rising very rapidly as a proportion. I think it's now overtaken as a proportion. It's overtaken Britain as a proportion of GDP. But it's going to take. Uh, it's going to take uh, some time. But I'm. I, I'm not. I, I think all. All. All cultures are capable of. We have a new template. Yes, I, yes, of course you're right. I, of course, Chinese. Well, you know, we're so unfamiliar with Chinese writers re, re, until very, very recently. Um, but if you look at the publications already uh, of Chinese novelists and so on, I mean, there's been a huge uh, expansion uh, over the past five, five years, even. Uh, 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 and I think will, you know, Chinese film is becoming. Uh, I mean, I, I was struck when I went to my son's school, and you know, I was, this was when he was 10 or 11, and uh, you know, and I, I was struggling to remember Chinese actors and film titles, and all, all these kids knew exactly uh, about, uh, uh, about them. So I think that uh, we're going to see a steady, uh, rapid expansion of Chinese culture in the West. Um, this gentleman been waiting, just sitting in front of the Chinese lady. In fact, I've got a business idea I'd like to suggest to you. Oh. I, I, I think that um, Chinese tea houses would be, uh, would, would, there would be a real market for very, sort of very, very well done Chinese tea houses. <laughs> John, John and I will discuss it later. We yes, we will. Uh, so, so you've been waiting a long time, sir. Yes, oh, yes Mr. Jacks. Uh, I... I'm not sure as to why you won't call India a civilization state. Okay. Uh, I'm sure you must have your reasons. Uh, but uh, being an Indian, I mean, that's a perspective uh, I always had that India too, like China, has been an uninterrupted civilization for the last uh, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 years. But my question is that, sure, uh, China's growth has been extremely rapid, 9 to 10% growth year on year. India has been far slower, 5 to 6% growth every year. But uh, also economists speak about some of the advantages India has, maybe a younger population, democracy, so on and so forth. But the, the main question I'm uh, concerned about tonight is that we have these two countries kind of growing at a rapid speed, currently China much faster than India. But what is the implication for the new global order of these two mm. countries you know, growing side by side? Uh, China and the United States, there's a huge ocean separating them, but China and India are, are, uh, share common borders, and they went to war in 1962, mm. Mm. right? So in terms of foreign policy and the Chinese worldview, uh, how do you see this phenomena of both these twins, uh, in a way, kind of uh, growing together? Maybe you should answer that now, because we're getting close to the end, and then we'll see where we are, okay? Or do you okay. Want do you, do you want, well, we only have well, five to eight. Can we just take them all? Take them all? No, just take whatever we think we can have, and then we'll. we'll yeah, we'll take one more from the lady there, and uh, and and then that's. I think that'll have to be it because it's five to eight. Go ahead. Um, I think all the development of China you mentioned about might be attributed to the so-called Chinese model if any. And this, under this model, um, China's economic um, is uh, quite nation, uh, uh, the state directly, and its economic really undergo a, a high development. However, the reform in political area in China, um, the development in this area 
uh, is quite limited, very, very limited. And, um, and this kind of China model has already um, arose a serious problem in China like corruption and other social problems. And do you think that if China is still uh, using this kind of Chinese model to develop itself, can its um, power or influence in the world continue? Can its development continue? in the yeah, maybe future 20 years or 50 years? I think you should answer those two, Mark. Okay. Uh, well, start with this. I'll start with yours first, because I'm liable to go on far too long on India and China. <laughs> um, I, I think that, uh, well, I mean, in terms of a development, a model of development, uh, there's no question that the Chinese model is hugely the most important, because... You know, the China's transformation is the, is the most remarkable transformation of any developing country over the last 30 years. And if you, I mean, one of the fascinating things is whatever happened to the Washington Consensus, um, which was the Western, the American position, and it's disappeared. And I think it's disappeared essentially for two reasons. One, because neoliberalism is in big crisis ever since 2008. I mean, it's still around because there isn't, you know, because there is an alternative, but it's still very powerful, but it's essentially bust. And the, the second reason um, uh, is because, you know, China has been so extraordinarily successful. I mean, China, in the last 30 years, is responsible for the overwhelming majority of the reduction in global poverty. If you took China out of the equation, the global figures look pretty bad. So China is, you know, China, China is the country that developing countries have to study uh, and have to learn from. It, 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 can't be, it can't be transplanted. It's impossible. It's a huge country. You know, only India is on the same basis. And it has a most unusual state, which cannot, you cannot transplant that state. The nearest you can do that, the, the countries that could do that potentially, are those that were brought up in that sort of Confucian tradition, like Korea, uh, Vietnam, and to a lesser extent, Japan. So I think that, uh, I think the Chinese model is enormously important. I mean, I think, you know, I think the, the, the China's rise in this sense has, has changed the world for the developing countries. I mean, this is hugely important. And also, I think the, the, the other, another reason why it's so important is, you know, there's a huge difference between China, the rise of China and the developing world, and America and the developing world, and that is, America is not a developing country. And, it, and, and, and China is. So China has a rapport and an empathy, an empathy with problems of development, which uh, America's never had, or Britain never had. I mean, hence the enormous commitment in Africa, I think. You know, to, the, the Chinese understand infrastructural development and why it's so basic, which is why they, you know, they, 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 they've made, everywhere they've gone, they, they, you know, they major on infrastructure as part of the economic relationship with developing uh, countries. Yeah, it's true, of course, you're right, that the political reform has been much more limited. Um, and uh, in time, maybe that will become um, uh, uh, more, more urgent uh, and, and so on. But um, um, we'll see, we'll see. I mean, that's, a big, that's another big question, isn't it? On the question of India and China, wow, this is a really good question. Um, I mean, I don't think India... I wouldn't classify India as a civilization state simply because, uh, you know, this great civilization only acquired uh, its, um, its um, independence and its control governed its own polity from 1947. So, you China, know, China's equivalent date is 221 BC. But, I, but of course, and I try to say this in the talk, there is a sort of uh, there are cert there's a certain point of points of identity between the two, even though what most strikes me in the relationship with China India is how is essentially how different they are, and how you talk about the relationship mutual incomprehension is probably the term I would use for the relationship between China and India. Um, they are so different in so many respects. Um, 
Uh, I'm not just thinking of politically, uh, but that's true, um, but culturally. The place of religion in society. I mean, China is essentially, uh, you know, there's no organized religion has ever been that important in China, and this is still true today. Um, but in India, you know, religion, re, re, religion is extremely important, whether you're a Hindu or a Muslim or a Sikh or whatever. So, um, and then of course the, the state occupies a different position. So these two, two, these two countries are very different. Um, what's the relationship going to be? This is a big question. I mean, when I was in India, I was really thinking about this a lot. And I think that um, uh, if I was talking to the Chinese, I'd say, you know, you, you don't take China, uh, India seriously nearly serious enough. There's a big country right on your borders. Okay, this is the borders of the Himalayas. But this is, you know, the, uh, and you can learn things from it. And if you want to understand the world, you've got to understand India and so on. Because at the moment China's understanding of the world I think is very limited. I mean, not least because it's major so much on the United States. Uh, if I was, when I was in India, I said this, I, I, I would say this, look, stop dreaming about overtaking China. Well, no, I, I, I said something different, actually. First I said, sort out the, the border. The Chinese are not bothered about the border. The Chinese aren't really very bothered about India, to be quite honest with you, because they think India's so far behind them and it's not such a big player. For India, Indians, that border dispute still riles. It's still, it, 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 it's something which, um, which, uh, constantly traumatizes, actually, the body politic in India. And as a result, India can never sort out its relationship with China. And it needs to sort out its relationship with China. So there's a great urgency on the Indian side to get rid of the border dispute, which is not that big anyway. I mean, it's, I mean the, what we're talking about isn't that important. By the way, the only border dispute that the Chinese have not sorted out is the one with India. All the other borders since 1949 is a great achievement to have sought out the border with Russia, the border with Russia, Vietnam, everything else, but not with India. So India needs to take the initiative, in my view, because it's more urgent for India. Secondly, India should abandon this mentality that they, you know, we'll overtake China in 3050 or whatever it's going to be. I, 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 I'm joking, but you know what I mean. It's so far ahead that prospect. You should, we should forget it. Indians should forget about it because it's dreamland, it's fantasy, fantasy thought. What India has to address is how do, what do we do now? What do we do now? How in the present, in the nitty gritty of the present, how do we secure sustainable, balanced Indian growth which tackles, including tackling the problems of poverty, etc. And to do this, I would suggest that India needs to learn from China. If I was in the Indian government, the first thing I would be, the priority I'd be stressing is, we, look, where do we need to learn from? Where is the most successful developing country? China. What can we learn from China? What, what, let's go there. Look, let's be like Japan was after the media restoration, and they were brilliant, and they were sent delegations all over, the, you know, all over Europe and the West, to learn about railways, learn how to organise the army, learn how to do the university, etc. And I think India needs to have the same kind of approach. My last point is this. We always talk, this is the great paradox, or maybe it's not a paradox at all. The great, we always talk about the great Indian democracy. Okay? We like this. Westerners, British feel very good about it because they think you know, it must be something to do with us. Pity it didn't happen when the British were in charge, of course. And, um, but the other side of India, the Indian state, is it's much more corrupt than the Chinese state. And it is not fit for purpose. It is, it is really, it, it is really a, a disaster. Area. So there you have China, no democracy, but a brilliant state. And there you have India, Fascinating democracy and a bloody useless state. <laughs> Discuss. That's the exact question. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you.